Hello, this is the webinar on Trauma-Informed Storytelling. This webinar is provided by the Center for Excellence in Peer Support, part of Self-Help at CMHA Waterloo Wellington. The Center for Excellence in Peer Support envisions a mental health and addiction system where peer support is available at every juncture of the system. We strengthen the practice of peer support by providing consultation and training to non-peer organizations on how to successfully implement and supervise peer staff roles. We offer ongoing supervision and support to peer staff working in non-peer organizations, and we further the evidence of the value of peer support and lived experience knowledge by engaging in research and evaluation. For more information on the Center for Excellence in Peer Support or on self-help, please see our website, www.self-help.ca. My name is Keely Phillips, and I will be walking you through this webinar on trauma-informed storytelling. So a little bit about this webinar. This is a follow-up webinar to our trauma-informed peer support webinar. So if you're not familiar with what trauma-informed peer support is, and you're somebody who engages in peer support work, we highly, highly recommend that you check out our trauma-informed peer support webinar first. It also, even if you're not engaged in peer support, gives a good understanding and introduction to how trauma impacts on a person and trauma-informed practice. This webinar is designed for people who share their recovery stories and also people who provide intentional peer support. We will use principles of trauma-informed practice in this workshop, so please feel free to pause at any time and seek supports as you need to. Please engage in self-care. Make yourself comfortable. This is about a 40-minute uh, webinar. This workshop may name examples of traumatic experiences. However, I won't go into details about those experiences and if I do go into details, it's only to provide clarity or context. It is done at an absolute minimum. Um, a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about um, the history of storytelling and peer support, the benefits and risks of sharing your story. Uh, we'll talk a little bit around the tricky subject of is trauma-informed storytelling censorship? And then we'll go into specifics of what trauma-informed storytelling looks like, and I'll leave you with a practice exercise that you can do on your own that will help you apply some of the principles of trauma-informed storytelling. The importance of storytelling to peer support. Storytelling is foundational to the history of peer support. When we look at the largest peer support movement in North America, that it's certainly Alcoholics Anonymous, and Alcoholics Anonymous was founded by Two men coming together and sharing their stories and feeling that there was value in sharing their stories with other people who were struggling. By sharing stories, we gain insight into how other people are coping. It's extremely important for us as peers to share our stories with one another. Sharing experiences of oppression and discrimination is what created the consumer survivor movement in the 1970s. People who were institutionalized and labeled and were given forced treatments when they came together and were able to identify that their experiences were a systemic failure and not a individual failure at all. That was what gave them the insight and the ability to organize and advocate for the changes that we've now seen um, in the mental health and addiction system. Storytelling is a useful tool to create systems change. Personal stories of recovery and resilience evoke emotions in a way that data alone does not. So just telling us, just, you know, knowing that one in five Canadians experiences a mental health issue at some point in their life doesn't go as far as knowing the person who experiences it um, and having a connection with them. And stories allow us to create that connection. Storytelling Stories can also create unity and inspire action, and they send a message of hope. Sometimes when we see people struggling, it's hard to see the hope in their situation, and stories are really useful in terms of being able to help see what for many people can be a very, very long journey, being able to see that journey um, with hope. And we've seen how stories... Um, can help shape policy as well, um, not related to mental health at all, but the story um, of a, um, a personal story um, during the European refugee crisis um, when a young boy drowned and washed up on the beach. Um, a lot of us remember that image, 
And that image actually shifted Canada's immigration policy. Um, that was a story of one family when it was millions of people fleeing their homes, you know, um, a party running for re-election didn't have a strong platform piece on bringing refugees to this country when it was one boy and his family's struggle and his family's efforts to try to find a better life suddenly it became much more personal and we were able to see, um, Canadian social policy shift, um, to, uh, Storytelling versus intentional sharing of lived experience. So when we talk about storytelling, um, that's different than when we do intentional sharing of lived experience or intentional peer support. So storytelling is a crafted story with a beginning and an end. Um, usually the format is, hi, my name's Keely. Um, this is some stuff that happened to me in my past. I struggled with depression and anxiety. This is what living with depression and anxiety looked like for me. Um, and, uh, a little bit around, you know, um, some of the bad times and then some stuff around, you know, treatment and getting better. And I tend to like, I like to throw in some stuff about, you know, resistance, um, and, uh, you know, trying to uh, shake up the system in, you know, incremental ways. Um, and then I end with, you know, where I'm at today and, uh, you know, that's, that's the structure of my story. I have a very linear story. Um, not everybody does. Um, when I'm intentionally sharing lived experience, um, it, with an individual that I'm providing peer support to, it looks a lot different. Um, I wouldn't start at the beginning of my story and tell my whole story every time I would based on what the person is experiencing, I would intentionally share the relevant parts of my experience with them in a, in a, in a way that is a means of connecting and there being a mutuality. Um, story tell, in storytelling, the story is told to an audience um, versus an intentional sharing of lived experience. The story is shared as part of a conversation. And so when we're sharing stories, we're talking at someone when we're intentionally sharing lived experience as part of a peer conversation, there's more than one voice being heard. Storytelling can, the function of it is much more limited um, in that it, it can create social change, which is a very important function. It can increase, in, in, it can increase understanding and expand our knowledge um, on, on issues. Um, when we're intentionally sharing our lived experience, we can connect with peers, we can establish collective lived experience, we identify systemic issues, we create social change, and we can expand our knowledge and increase and maybe even increase our understanding of um, how other people experience um, similar problems to us. So we see that there's, you know, broader function um, with the intentional sharing of lived experience than there is in um, sharing stories. Storytelling can, can occur and often does occur without mutuality. Um, I can walk into a room and share my story and leave without knowing anything about people in the room. Um, when I'm intentionally sharing my lived experience in a peer way, there has to be some mutuality present. Um, we have to learn about one another through sharing our experiences. So the personal benefits to sharing your recovery story. Um, it can feel cathartic. It feels really good to get out your story. Um, and it can make the unseen visible. It's, it's nice to be able to find a way to um, express the emotions and the pain um, and to be able to highlight the systemic issues or the strength and the resilience that we have that maybe other people don't see. Um, and we can also use our stories to reclaim our voice and to feel empowered I would question whether or not, you know, our own personal catharsis is a equally as important as reclaiming voice and feeling empowered, and that maybe stories that are just for our own catharsis look different than ones where we are um, reclaiming voice and feeling empowered, in that it's very easy for me to tell a story that is cathartic to me, but um, is maybe traumatizing to people in my audience to hear. And so maybe those cathartic stories are the ones that I work on, you know, maybe in more of a therapeutic relationship with somebody and not to a broader audience in terms of storytelling. Um, 
And, you know, making the unseen visible is important. We just need to make sure we're doing it in a trauma-informed way. If your story can identify a systemic issue, that's fantastic. But are you doing it in a way that is maybe glorifying poverty? And so we want to make sure that that's not going on. Love the idea of reclaiming voice and feeling empowered through our stories. The only thing is, is that sometimes we think what we're doing by telling all of our story, including all the gritty details, is being empowered. And then we get kind of an emotional hangover after telling our story. And so by ensuring that we're following trauma-informed storytelling practices, we can help to um, craft our story in such a way that actually leaves us feeling empowered where we don't overshare. There's also benefits to your audience in hearing your story. So storytelling helps in program evaluation. It helps communities and agencies assess the needs and strengths and to evaluate a program throughout its life. Um, even at self-help, we use storytelling as a means of program evaluation. When we ask people about what their experience of recovery has been since they started coming to self-help services. We also have seen in the consumer survivor movement how storytelling is a useful organizational tool. Um, at the very beginning of this webinar, I talked about the history of storytelling to the self-help and consumer survivor movement. And that is as useful today as it was in the 1970s and 80s. We see this particularly right now in the Black Lives Matter movement, where we need to hear the individual stories of the people who are being shot by the police in order to really gain an understanding and to for people to really be able to collectively come together to create that social change. Storytelling is also useful in terms of advocacy. And so organizations will often employ stories of families or individuals as a means of fundraising or um, working for policy advocacy. So I'm um, thinking of uh, recently there was a local article around the experience of living on um, Ontario Disability Support Program. And that was, you know, one individual story of living in poverty that was used to highlight a systemic issue. And obviously the authors of that article, as well as the subject of that article, the storyteller, is hoping that their story will lead to policy change. Storytelling is also useful for education. Um, and here again, we see that this is where, you know, it's useful in terms of reaching out to the public and, pr and providing insight to the public on what it's like to live with a mental health issue, what it's like to live with an addiction or substance use issue. So one tip that I would provide you is when you're asked to share your story, find out why. Um, what is the audience hoping to get from hearing your experience? And I would caution you, you know, against sharing your story with audiences that are only looking to hear about how bad things are and then how you overcame them. Sort of the, um, the word um, poverty gawking or has, has sometimes been used um, to describe those types of stories. And those are the things we want to get away from while recognizing that there is a lot of value in learning about a person's experience through an individual story. So there's also some risks to sharing your story. And as I mentioned in one of the previous slides, I've experienced some of these risks myself. Um, particularly, and I'll start with the personal risks, around vulnerability. So if I share too much, then I feel very vulnerable after my after I've told my story. I go, oh my gosh, I shared something in there that I wouldn't have shared with my closest friends and family. And so what does it mean now that a room full of 100 people knows that about me? And there's also the issue of ownership. Once you share your story and it's out there, it's gone. You have no control over what people do with your story. And I've seen this happen a lot with mental health storytelling and addiction storytelling as well, that because everybody's going to take little bits of it away differently. And so what they're going to do is if something really 
struck a chord for them, they're going to go when they're going to go home and they're going to have dinner tonight with their families and they're going to say, so I heard this great story by this woman named Keely today about recovery from a mental health issue. And the one thing that really stuck with me was and you want to make darn sure when you're sharing your story that you're doing it intentionally so that the one thing that really stuck with them wasn't something about how traumatic and terrible life has been for you, but something about how resilient and strong you have been or something about how um, something that not only sends a message of hope, because I'm also cautious around stories that are, you know, raw, 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 it's all fuzzy and warm um, and good. That's also not particularly trauma-informed storytelling. Um, but you want to make sure that what sticks with people is something that's genuine and insightful and something that you really, you know, defines who you are. So, and it's hard. It's it's a risk that you take, right? The, what they take away from it might be the three times you said, um, in your story. It might be what you were wearing and not at all what you said. It might be that you needed to work on your public speaking skills in general a little bit. Or it might be that you were an incredibly dynamic speaker and they felt inspired to hear you. So there's also the risk of co-optation as well. Um, and this, what this looks like is your story gets co-opted by an organization as a means of promoting their services or their recovery tools and uh, I really urge you to be very cautious around if somebody wants you to share your story, do they want it to be used as a means of promoting their services? Because I'm really, I'm not, I'm not very comfortable with that. And I would ask you if you're comfortable with being used as an advertisement. So they, there's also risks to your audience as well. Your audience risks include being triggered. You need to assume that everybody in that audience has a lived experience of trauma. Even if you are talking to a room full of psychiatrists, assume everybody in that audience has an experience of trauma. And so your audience can be triggered if you're sharing details that don't need to be shared in order to gain an understanding of, of you. And of your recovery. Your audience, another risk to your audience is that sometimes when we're not intentional in our storytelling, there's a lack of context that can lead to misunderstanding or to furthering myths, stereotypes, or reinforcing oppressive structures. So I often use an example of when I was in hospital, I, one day we decided to um, pull a bit of a prank. And we, uh, so several patients decided to set up a fake medication window where we help, where we, right across from the medication window where all the patients lined up and they were all given their Dixie cups of water and their medication. And so we decided to set one up right across the hallway from that where we had Dixie cups of water and gave out Skittles to everybody. And that's a really funny story. It's really funny when I share it in a room of people who know what it's like to be in hospital. It's moderately funny when I share it to a public audience. And it's not very funny when I share it in a room full of nurses and doctors. They don't find that super funny because one of the things that we were accused of was, you know, making a mockery of our treatment. And so understanding the context of who you are speaking to also helps for you to be able to ensure that the story that you are sharing isn't putting you at risk of being misunderstood and there being further, you know, the myths or stereotypes about people with mental health or addiction issues is, aren't furthered. So there's also in general just a little bit of a backlash around storytelling that I think is important to talk about because as much as I feel that storytelling is an incredibly useful tool, there are some very valid criticisms of it. And this is from Recovery in the Bin, which is a um, UK website. I encourage you to check it out if you're not familiar with any of the critiques around storytelling. And they say, we oppose how peer support workers are now expected to have acceptable recovery stories that entail gratuitous self-exploration and versions of successful recovery, fulfilling expectations. 
yet no such job requirements are expected of other workers in the mental health sector. We refuse to feel compelled to tell our stories in order to be validated, whether as peer support workers, activists, campaigners, and or academics. We believe being made to feel like you have to tell your story to justify your experience is a form of disempowerment under the guise of empowerment. We need a broader range of survivor narratives to be recognized, honored, respected, and promoted that include an understanding of the difficulties and struggles that people face every day when unable to recover and not just successful recovery type stories. One of the things that really strikes me in this quote is the last part around, around broader range of survivor narratives. And that really resonates with me. And that's one of the reasons that I really don't like sharing my story very much anymore is because there's thousands of stories that are very similar to mine out there. And I would like to create space for the stories that aren't about the white middle-class heterosexual woman who experienced depression and then got help for it and got better and went on with her life. There's a lot of those stories. And it's not to say that I don't feel that there's value in my story in my life. There totally is value. And I use my experiences in my work. However, I don't think that my story is, there's nothing, I don't think that there's anything unique and special about my story and I would like to see space for people who don't have the same recover, who haven't had the same recovery trajectory as me and people who come from more diverse cultural and economic backgrounds and can speak to the intersectionality of various forms of systemic oppression, things that I haven't experienced, but I feel are incredibly important for us to be able to address if we really are serious as a society about helping people cover from mental health and addiction issues, we need to address the complexity of, intersect of, of intersecting oppressions. So is this censorship? Kind of. When people are speaking on behalf of an agency, the agency does bear some responsibility to the message conveyed. And so if you're asked to speak to a group of people um, either as a staff person or a volunteer of an agency, um, the agency does, you know, they, they can very well ask you to speak about certain things. What I would suggest is if you're an agency, try not to edit somebody, anybody's story in order to be an advertisement for your service. That is not ethical at all. Um, and if you're an individual, if you can ensure that you are staying true to the principles of trauma-informed storytelling that we're going to get into in a minute, your 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 story is probably is probably okay. Um, it probably you know and sure it's an agency might say hey can you talk you know when you tell your story can you specifically talk to talk about how exercise helps you and you know what that's that's a form of censorship is to help direct part of what's in there. And it's up to you to determine, you know, whether or not that's something you're comfortable with. But recognize, just like, you know, if you share your story, you lose ownership of it. You, when you enter into an agreement with an organization to be a speaker for them, you are, you've already lost ownership of it. And so that agency can ask you to talk about specific things and not talk about other things. And you always, always, always have the right to back out of an agreement and say, nope, you know what? It turns out I'm not comfortable not talking about how, you know, um, using alternatives to medication was something that helped me. And if you won't let me speak without speaking about that, then I'm not going to be your speaker. And that's okay. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's empowered storytelling is sometimes choosing when not to tell your story. In addition, additionally, as mental health and addictions workers, we have a responsibility to minimize risk of harm when we can. And that's why it's important for us to, you know, stay away from the gritty, sensationalizing details of traumatic experiences. Trauma-informed storytelling can also facilitate a dialogue by creating safer spaces that allow for oppressed voices to speak up. So when I talked about needing to create more diverse narratives of our experiences, trauma-informed storytelling can actually help do this because safe space allows the people 
who maybe haven't felt comfortable speaking up because their story is maybe so radically different, trauma-informed storytelling can help create a little bit of that safe space to do so. So what does trauma-informed storytelling look like? This is a little bit of a checklist that I've created on what this looks like. It assumes the experience of trauma in the audience. So I mentioned this before, regardless of who your audience is, regardless of how many people are in it, if you're telling your recovery story, assume that people in the audience have experienced trauma. Trauma-informed storytelling ensures that any discussion of trauma fits into the purpose of the discussion. So refrain from just throwing in references to traumatic experiences. Trauma-informed storytelling can label the type of traumatic event, right? It might be useful for the people in the audience to know whether or not we're talking about witnessing a tragic accident or interpersonal violence. So you can label the type of traumatic event that you've experienced. That's okay. Um, and then you create a context that helps the audience understand what is happening for you and for the environment and the system. And you do that without going into specific details around, you know, it was a windy day, um, it was the middle of November. We don't need those details, but, you know, it creates a context that explains what happened for you both immediately after the trauma and then in your recovery and how you internalized the experience and how it has impacted on you. And it can talk about the environment in terms of what was happening with the, um, you know, were there, were there factors that, um, environmental factors or systemic factors that maybe contributed to this. And this is, you know, where it, we can start to identify some of the systemic issues that can contribute to trauma as well. Trauma-informed storytelling is balanced between describing what happened to you and how you overcame it. And so although we want to make sure that we're not going into gritty details, we can label the experience and we can talk about how it impacted us. Um, and then we, and then we move into, you know, recovering and it's okay if our recovery isn't complete. It's okay if our recovery is still going on. Stories don't need to, trauma-informed storytelling doesn't demand that you be recovered. It doesn't demand that you no longer be struggling. And we want, we still want to ensure that, you know, when we can find little glimmers of hope or resilience or strength, that we're identifying those and sharing those as well. It doesn't need to be rah, 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 rah you know, I overcame trauma and, you know, and here's my three steps to doing so. It doesn't need to be that. It can simply be, here's what happened to me, how it impacted me, and here's how I'm working to overcome it. And just doing that and using clear, simple language that avoids slang and idioms and clinical terms really helps people understand what it's like for you as either a trauma survivor or a person who's living with a mental health or addiction issue or all of those things together. And trauma-informed storytelling is hopeful, but also realistic. And I think I talked about that in the bit between, you know, striking the balance and that you find the glimmer of hope and you, you point it out, you point out I'm here today and it can be realistic and say, I'm still struggling. So parts of your trauma-informed story. So the traumatic event, as I've mentioned before, you can label the event, but avoid the details of the event. You don't want to paint a picture of a traumatic event. What you want to do is just give people the context, right? So that they have an understanding of what it is you've gone through, but not so much that it feels like they're looking at a photograph. An impressionist painting will do. The meaning of the event. So the meaning of the event to you. How did you process what happened to you? How did you feel and think about what happened to you? And recognizing that the meaning of the traumatic event is going to change for you throughout your recovery process. That's normal. 
and then the impact of the event on your presence life, on your present life, which can be both painful and hopeful. And this is where you may detail your coping strategies. And it's okay if some of your coping strategies are mediocre. I love it when people say that their coping strategies are to eat microwave popcorn and play video games. That's okay. Um, it's also, you know, okay for people to say that their coping strategies are to smoke an entire pack of cigarettes. Are not so healthy, but maybe harm reduction focused coping strategies. Those are real coping strategies that work for us. If you're somebody who uses the bubble glass, the bubble bath, and and tea coping strategy, and tea and yoga class and meditation strategies, and those work for you, that's that's awesome. Share those strategies too. But also don't feel that you have to have, you know, the world's healthiest coping strategies in order to be sharing what they are. Because you know what, we need to know what the real ones are that really help people get through some pretty tough stuff too. So trauma-informed storytelling is a lot like a superhero story, superhero origin story in a lot of ways. The superhero story asks us, where have you been? It's an origin story that's integral to any superhero narrative. We have to appreciate the history of the individual in order to understand his or her current emotional and mental condition. Superman's ability to sublimate his traumatic origins by means of heroic acts is what keeps readers returning for more than 75 years. And that excerpt is from Asylum Magazine at www.asylumonline.net. So your story is not trauma-informed if it names people or describes people in detail or describes a traumatic event in detail. If it glorifies any traumatic experience, including systemic trauma such as poverty or unhealthy practices and choices. So I've heard a lot of people tell stories that glorify drug use, that glorify psychosis. Um, and it's not to say that we can't find humor in our experiences, because certainly we can. Um, we just need to make sure that we're not glorifying things that make it make people desire to hear more about how bad it got in a um, voyeuristic way. Your story is not trauma informed if it's more about how bad it got than it is about your recovery and how you got better, or if you're not better than how you got to, you know, where you are today, how you're coping. Um, your story is not trauma informed if it reinforces myths or stereotypes or oppressive structures. I've never heard this story, but maybe somebody out there is telling their story about how seclusion and restraint in the hospital is, you know, super helpful to them. Um, that would be a story that is, you know, reinforcing an oppressive practice. So, you know, I would ask that person, that fictional person who probably exists somewhere. Um, to consider not including that in their story. Your story is not trauma-informed if it needs changes in order to be PG-rated. So imagine you are speaking to a room of 12-year-olds. Is your story suitable for them? Even if you're not speaking to a room of 12-year-olds, assume you are. Your story is not trauma-informed if it's an advertisement for a service or medication or treatment. It's just an advertisement then. So I'm going to leave you with a practice activity um, that uh, feel free to choose to, uh, to do that would help you um, if, if you're not really sure how to make your story trauma informed, you can try it. You can start with somebody else's uh, story first. And uh, so meet Clark Kent, um, a.k.a. Superman. When he was a kid, he witnessed his parents die in a natural disaster. Clark escaped to the U.S. where he found great adoptive parents. Clark's now in his 20s and is working as a journalist. In some ways, Clark is a very regular guy, but not in every way. Clark has been labeled a superhero. He experiences super strength and super speed. He can fly. Clark is both a victim and a perpetrator of violence. And he struggles with an overwhelming need to protect others. He is torn between wanting to save the world and wanting to live a quiet life. Clark experiences flashbacks to the disaster that killed his parents. And he's just been invited to speak about his experiences at a clinical staff training day for people working with superheroes. He's unsure about what to say as he wants to strike a balance between what happened to him, what makes him unique, and what he struggles with. 
So what I would ask you to do is to, in three or four paragraphs, write out tr Clark's trauma-informed story. Um, so that's an activity that I'm going to leave you with. Um, also feel free to apply the concept of concepts of trauma-informed storytelling to um, your own recovery story, especially if you're somebody who does share your story um, to a broad audience on a regular basis. So some recommended reading for you if you want to learn more about um, what uh, the resources that I used to create this webinar. Um, recovery is a Journey of the Heart is a good example of a recovery story. It's by Patricia Deegan. The Problem with Safer Spaces, it's critical thinking about sharing our experiences. Recovery in the Bin, I mentioned earlier, it's a radical anti-system um, website and has some excellent points on the problems with recovery stories. The Origin of Our Stories, Superheroes and Mental Health Practice, that was an article in um, Asylum Magazine um, that I talked about. And When PTSD is Contagious is an article in The Atlantic on secondary trauma. Finally, if you'd like more information, please feel free to contact me. My address is kphillips at selfhelp.ca, or you can check out our website www.self-help.ca for more information on self-help services. I hope you enjoyed this webinar.